Okay, hey, good afternoon. Hopefully everyone's popping in to the broadcast. Welcome, this is Cindy Davidson. I'm the Education Chair for SILA, and I'm here to welcome our June webinar speaker. We are so, so lucky to have um, Deirdre Patton joining us today. Such a treat, our very own Deirdre Patton will be taking us through a brief but fascinating history of securities regulation. Those of you who have the, had the pleasure to attend Deirdre's Securities Basics live class at the SILA annual conference, you guys already know what a fount of knowledge Deirdre brings to every event. Um, Deirdre actually started in the securities industry as a principal in 1983, and, and Deirdre, since for contemporaries, I can say that's probably before half the people on this phone were uh, were born, let alone engaging in the industry. Um, and, then, and then she took on roles in compliance, supervision, and training. In fact, uh, she's been teaching the Series 7 since 1987, so that's a fun fact. There's not going to be a quiz at the end, but I just thought that was a fun fact to throw in. Deirdre currently operates two businesses, Patent Training and Review, which is down in Houston, Texas, and also Sanger Consulting, which is up in New Hampshire. So when she's not flying across the country, She's serving as the Chief Compliance Officer and FinOp for a bunch of small broker dealers. She's also training people to take and pass their securities exams and is a sponsor of the FinOp Exchange. So Deirdre's been with SILA forever. I, I'm sure most of you know her already. She has served seven years on the SILA board as the Education Chair and as President. She received the President's Award in 2012 and was the first recipient of the Bruce Sanger Education Award in 2014. So please help me welcome Deirdre Patton, and I can't wait to learn everything there is to know about securities regu registration. Take it away, Ms. Deirdre. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. And welcome, everybody. Thank you. I know that this is a riveting concept. We'll try to make it as exciting as possible. Also wanted to mention that this is an interactive um, broadcast. So if there's something you'd like to ask, pop it in the chat, uh, the chat box. We're happy to take questions during the session. Thanks again. Here we go. All right. I'm moving forward with my slides. There we go. So the, the Security Exchange uh, Commission, the Security Exchange Commission are the big kids in the securities industry. They are a office of the government. They have appointed officers to them, and they actually write rules after Congress passes laws. Then we have self-regulatory organizations, also known as designated examining authorities, and this group is membership organizations. So the broker dealers, the registered reps, and, and, um, and associated persons are all members of the self-regulatory organization. So an SRO, also known as the DEA, designated examining authority. Some of the SROs or DEAs would be the New York Stock Exchange, FINRA, and FINRA is the one we probably deal with the most, and the Municipal Security Rulemaking Board. So municipal securities are state and local government securities. Now that we have that, we have the big governing body, the SEC, we have the self-regulatory organization, and we have the states. So NASA is the state organization. It is the North America Society of Administrators, um, and this deals with the state administrators. I think it's somewhere around 43-ish states are actually members, and this is the state regulation. So we also have to deal with state regulations, and they have their own required exams that are required to be taken. So a broker-dealer has to be registered in every state where they're doing business, and an agent or associated person also has to be registered in every state where they're doing business. So not only do we have the national, we also have the state laws that can, to look into. Then we have the CFTC. CFTC is actually the commodity group. So they're the equivalent of the SEC for securities. CFTC is for commodities. So if we were going to be trading pork bellies or any kind of grains or oil and gas, we might be actually under a different governing body. And their SRO is the NFA, National Futures Association. All right. I, I actually love this stuff. I'm pretty excited. I'm going to talk a little bit about capital markets. Capital markets is how we raise money to run our businesses and our companies. So the capital markets are um, raising money in corporate America to operate our businesses. There's two ways to raise money. There's 
equities, which is ownership, and there's debt securities. So right now we're going to talk a little bit about equities. Whenever we're talking about equities, we're talking about ownership of the corporation. So if somebody owns stock, they actually have an ownership interest in the corporation. The shareholders have rights. I'm, going to, I'm doing a little quote sign. I know you can't see me and you're lucky not to. But anyways, they have rights, shareholders' rights, some of those rights to receive dividends. Dividends are an income for the investor, but it's only if the dividend was declared. So the board of directors always have to declare the dividend. So even if a company has paid dividends for 40 years and they decide not to declare one this year, they don't have to pay. Also, they have the right to inspect the books, right? Companies, uh, the shareholders do, and the shareholders have limited liability. Now, there's two basic kinds of stock. We're going to talk about them real quickly. There's common stock. Every company has common stock, right? So it's high risk, great potential reward. Um, they have a residual claim to assets, means they're the last to get paid in order of liquidation. And we have preferred stock. Oh, I love the word. Preferred takes priority or precedence. It has a little bit lower risk level than a common stock shareholder would have. And it's income oriented. They don't have any voting rights and they take preference in order of liquidation. As mentioned, we also have debt securities. So when a corporation starts out, they can either issue equity, which is stock, and you would be a, the investor would be an owner, or they can issue debt, which would be a bond. So the issuers of debt instruments would be corporations. That's what we've been talking about so far. The U.S. government, right, they can issue debt, and municipalities. Municipalities are state and local governments. So the issuer, corporation, U.S. government, municipality, wants to borrow money from the investor. Sometimes you'll see the word leverage financing. The investor is a bondholder, and they effectively lend money to the issuer. There's a fixed interest rate that's paid, usually semi-annually, and it's an income investment. Oftentimes, when people are near retirement and they need a supplement to their income, they might want to have more of their investment in bonds. All right, now let's talk a little bit more about corporate bonds. So there's different level of corporate bonds. I don't know if you saw the big short. Those are actually where CMOs, which are collateral mortgage obligations, which is a whole other animal all into itself. But regular corporate bonds break down into secured bonds and unsecured bonds. Secured bonds actually have a specific asset backing them. So if there is a default on the bond, meaning the issuer didn't pay the interest, or is unable to pay the principal or the amount back to the investor, we say that there, there is a default, there will be some kind of collateral that secures the bondholder. Similar to when you borrow money to purchase your house, if you do not make payments to the lender, they could sell your house to satisfy the bondholder, or a car also works that way. Same thing here with a corporation. So a corporation, if they have secured bonds, some of the assets used to secure could be a mortgage. A mortgage would be based on land, real estate, or property. Or it can be an equipment trust certificate. Equipment trust certificate is issued on rolling stock. Rolling stock would be major movable equipment. Things like planes, automobiles, boats would, would qualify for equipment trust certificate. The last one there that's a secured bond under corporate structure is a collateral trust certificate. I'm sitting here with a Dell computer, and on the corner of it, it says um, it has an Intel Pinion processor, and I really have no idea what that means. I can go ask my 15-year-old in a minute, and he'll tell me. But in any case, it would make sense that Dell Corporation might own shares of Intel since they need their Pinion processor, and I might even be reading that wrong, their Pinion processor in order to operate. So if it was a collateral trust certificate, Dell Corporation would actually use Intel stock as their collateral. So if Dell defaulted on their bond, then they would sell the Intel stock to satisfy the bondholder. But in any case, a corporate bond that's secured has a specific collateral back in it. Now, if it's an unsecured bond, it's, hey, trust us, pay, we'll pay you back. So it's only backed by the full faith and credit of the corporation. So if the corporation was, I don't know, uh, Microsoft, probably pretty safe. Microsoft is an established company, et cetera. If the corporation was steered with Somali Hut, number one, I don't know how to make Somalis. Number two, I would be more of a credit risk. So then the debenture would be a little bit more risky. So an unsecured bond is backed by the full faith and the credit of the issuer, which would be a corporation. 
sometimes they're called the venture, or if it agreed to take a lower lien priority, they might call it a subordinated debenture. So a subordinated debenture is paid off after all other creditors of the corporation are paid. So it'd be a subordinated debenture, and they have a lower lien priority. Still before equity, so. All right, government. I always remember the government's a little goofy. So they have short-term debt instruments called T-bills. I remember they're short-term because I have to pay my bills short-term. Treasury notes are intermediate terms, two to 10 years, and treasury bonds are long-term, more than 10 years. So treasury bonds are considered long-term debt instruments. I remember that because they don't bind you out of jail, you're in there for the long term. <laughs> but, never mind. All right, municipalities. This is state and local government. If you have a state, county, city, taxing district, for their infrastructure, they often need to raise money. So it could be a port authority or a turnpike authority or a school district. What's great about municipal bonds and investors often like is they have a federally tax exempt interest. So when the investor receives their interest on their investment, then they don't have to pay taxes on it. So that's a huge benefit to municipal bonds. So people that are looking for tax relief might do that. So once again, in summary, if we want to raise money, we can do it through equity, which is ownership. They pay a dividend. They're higher risk. We can have appreciation or income. And this is for stock. Debt is the investor is a creditor. The debt instrument pays interest. It's lower risk, and we do it for income. So those are the two different things you can balance out your portfolio as an investor between debt and equity. Equity is ownership. Debt, you're the investor is a creditor. Wow. Well, one of the things we were going to talk about today is Securities Act. So the Security Act of 1933 was actually the first act out there. Before this, the, all the securities were run through the Federal Trade Commission. So the Security Act of 1933 dealt with new issues. It was the new act that dealt with new issues. Sometimes you casually hear her term, excuse me, as the Paper Act. And the reason why it has to do with all the disclosures and the paper. So the issuer wants to raise money they're gonna hire a broker dealer who's gonna act as an underwriter. So when you hear the word underwriter, sometimes if you're in the insurance side, that's a whole different meaning. On the security side, it means that they're an investment banker to help the issuer raise money. So the broker dealer acting as an investment banker or an underwriter. Securities are registered with the SEC. And this is where you're gonna have disclosure documents. So if you've heard the word perspective or offering circular, or any of these words, these are the disclosure documents that people get. So the 33 Act dealt with new issues, and we call it the Paper Act. The first of all, the Securities Act. Ah, then the Security, Ex oh, I love the word, Security Exchange Act of 1934, that's what requires all the people to be registered. We call it the People Act. 33 happened in about November, 34 happened in February, so they were pretty close together but they were the People Act in 1934. It dealt with the secondary market. So the exchanges, like the New York Stock Exchange, which is an auction market, right? So they have a designated market maker. It's sort of an auction market, physical location. And then we have the over-the-counter markets, which are negotiated. Over-the-counter negotiated market, there's multiple market makers, and people are negotiating the price of the security. So the exchange is an auction, the over-the-counter is negotiated. In any case, it's secondary market. And what this means is that the broker-dealer is trading the security from an investor to another investor. So secondary market is investor to investor. When we talked about 1933, that was when the issuer was raising money, right? The new issue market is when the corporation actually gets the money. Once Apple sells their stock out and they raise the money to do the Mac and the iPhone and all the other things that they have, now if you buy Apple stock, you're actually buying it from another investor, right? Now, under the 1934 People Act, it also requires the registration of broker-dealers and associated persons. So to, in order to be registered, um, you have to be a registered broker-dealer or associated person. In order to sell securities, you have to be registered. 
All right. And then in 1940, we came up with package products. And there was like different types of package products. But the one that you and I would probably know the most about is mutual funds. So mutual funds actually came in effect in 1940. So in 1940, they had the Investment Company Act. And they had different classifications of investment companies. And one of them was a managed company. And what it meant is there was a manager that managed the investment for a specific investment objective. So out of the managed companies, there was open-end managed com management companies and closed-end management companies. Mutual funds are actually an open-end investment company. Now, what they mean by open-end is whenever the investor buys, they're buying new shares in the investment company. So they have a pooled portfolio that of securities. They might have AT&T and Walmart and Microsoft and Intel and all these different securities. It might have municipal bonds. It might have U.S. government based on its investment objective. So it's got a diversified portfolio. And the investor will buy shares in ones that, in a mutual fund that meets their investment objective. Now, these shares are redeemable, meaning the fund will buy them back. So if the investor no longer wants the security, the investor can redeem them back to the mutual fund company. So they're redeemable. And they have to get their money back in seven days. So it's kind of a nice little thing. So if you only have $100 to invest, you probably could buy like a half a share of, of well, maybe you could buy one and a half shares of Microsoft, right? Or maybe one and a quarter share. We can't do that. So instead of doing that, you'll buy shares in a mutual fund and you can own Microsoft and AT&T and Walmart and you know, et cetera. All right, terrific. Next, we have options. An option is actually a contract between two parties. An option is considered what's called a derivative. I love the words. They always help me remember things. A derivative means they derive their value from something else. So if I have a contract enabling me to buy Microsoft at $62 a share, and Microsoft is currently selling at 72, oh my gosh, that right to buy it at 62 is worth at least $10 a share, right? So instead of buying the Microsoft, I could buy the right to buy Microsoft. Well, I'd spend less money, right? Because I just have a contract allowing the right to buy. So an option is a contract between two parties. The buyer is called the holder and they have the rights. The seller is often called the writer and they have the obligation. So one party might have the right to buy or sell, and the other party would have the obligation, right? One contract, two sides. Two types of contracts we have in options. We have a call. A call is the right to buy. You have the right to purchase, so you can call it away. A put is the right to sell. You can put the stock to somebody. So you get the right to sell. You can put it to them, and you have the right to sell. If I own and I'm not making any <laughs> best in recommendations, but a few years ago, if I owned shares at Exxon and the oil and gas industry went down, right? But I thought, you know, Exxon's a pretty solid company. They had just built their headquarters about 10 miles away from where I live. I think, you know what? I think they're gonna be okay. I really do. But just in case, I own lots of shares of Exxon. I'm making this up. But if I own a lot of shares of Exxon, just in case I want to buy the right to sell Exxon at a later date in case I'm wrong and the market continues to go down, I'm going to lock in a price to sell my Exxon. So whether you own a, a, excuse me, a call, which is the right to buy, or a put, which is the right to sell, they're both good investments for the right investor. So an option is a contract between two parties. We use the word derivative. It derives its value from the underlying security. Well, the insurance guys get into the investment world as well. So the insurance group came up with a, similar to a mutual fund, it's got a pooled investment. They call it a variable annuity. So if you see the word variable annuity, it's not only a securities product, it's also an insurance product. So it has a little bit of the uh, features of both. So variable annuities always have what's called a separate account. So a separate account is actually where the investment occurs. So instead of the insurance company's general account where their life insurance and their property and casualty and all the other things happen, when they have a variable, they have a separate account. The separate account has investment risk. The investor should know that. And there's two phases. 
So when somebody buys a variable annuity, they're going to be putting money in the pay-in phase. And the investor will get what's called accumulation units. Just for fun, just to tell you what an accumulation unit, it actually is an accounting measure used to determine the annuitant, somebody that has an annuity, the annuitant's interest in a separate account. So if Cindy put 100000 in, she's going to have more accumulation units than I did if I put $10 in, right? So it says how much of the separate account the individual owns. Then at some later date, or maybe right away, it could be an immediate annuity, the investor or the annuitant will annuitize. Annuitize is the payout period. Here's the great thing. Two great things. Number one, it grew tax deferred, so I haven't paid taxes on any of the gains. Number two, it gets me a lifetime income. So the insurance product has different features um, from a regular investment product like a mutual fund. So it's got some tax benefit and it's got a guaranteed life income once the investor annuitizes. All right, there's also a variable type of life insurance. Now it's still life insurance, but it has the word variable, so there's a separate account, which does have investment risk. A variable life has a fixed or level premium, but there's a variable death benefit depending on the value of the separate account. So maybe if somebody's younger and they have a long time you know, to live, they might wanna do a variable annuity because the separate account could actually outperform, in theory, a more traditional whole life or term life policy. So there's both an example of a general and a separate account with a variable life, and there's usually a minimum death benefit. Now a variable, once again, has a separate account, variable, I say separate account. So a variable has a separate account and has a flexible premium. So now when I still have children at home, I'm gonna, and they're gonna go to school and all these other things, I'm gonna need a pretty big death benefit, so I'm gonna put more of a premium. But well, once he's out of the house, he's doing his own thing, just me and my husband, our house is paid off theoretically, then I might need a lower death benefit. So I have the ability different stages in my life to adjust my premium and therefore ultimately adjust my death benefit. But there's still a separate account and I am taking investment risk. All right. Now that was all about the products and all that kind of good stuff. Now let's talk a little bit about regulation and registration and regulation, all that wonderful stuff. Really exciting, I know. Okay, firms and associated persons. So let's talk a little bit about that. The broker dealer and the investment advisor are both the firm, right? So these are legal entities, corporations, limited liability companies, partnerships, but the broker dealer and the investment advisor are firms. Let's look at the difference between the two. A broker-dealer is transaction-based, so a broker-dealer is going to make money if a transaction occurs, where an investment advisor is, quote, quote, fee-based. So the investment advisor gives advice and is a fee-based, right? So they don't, no transaction needs to occur. Broker-dealer, transaction-based, investment advisor, fee-based. Now, underneath the broker dealer, we have a registered principal. I always remember, who's your pal? Your principal. And the reason I say that is that's your supervisor or your manager. So your supervisor has additional registrations they're required to get, and they act as a principal. They're responsible for supervision and compliance. Underneath the pal or the principal, they're going to have a registered rep. A registered rep is actually registered with the firm and has a principal that supervises them. And there's also a non-registered fingerprint. So people that aren't registered that maybe work on the original books and, and, and um, uh, books and records of the firm like accounting or somebody that might uh, like a sales assistant or a receptionist that might actually um, come across securities or money would have to be fingerprinted. So non-registered fingerprint. So registered has to take a registration qualification exam. Non-registered fingerprint simply has to get fingerprinted. Now in the investment advisor, we have an investment advisor representative. So investment advisor representative is an individual who works for an investment advisor. Remember, broker-dealer transaction-based, investment advisor fee-based. Now in the municipal guys, they've really kicked it in for the last few years. I mean, really kicked it in. Lots more regulation, lots of things going on. So under the municipal world, we have a municipal securities broker-dealer 
you can actually have a bank dealer too who doesn't have to be registered on the security side. So because municipals are exempt security, local banks can actually also become a bank dealer. That's just something to put in your back pocket. Um, and then there's a municipal advisor. So a municipal advisor is somebody who gives advice to a municipality. This was a huge net that got cast a few years ago. So all kinds of people that might not necessarily um, be involved with the um, uh, with things that you normally would think of, they're actually a municipal advisor. So it wouldn't be necessarily investments. I actually should have put municipal advisor there instead of investment advisor. They might do things by investment, but they might also be advising on, you know, how many lights you have to have in downtown, you know, downtown Chicago, right? They might be advising in that way. So not necessarily on investments. All right, now we have the FINRA Gateway. So FINRA is our self-regulatory organization. We chatted about them a little bit earlier. So they have all these things, there's broker dealers, there's registered reps, all that information is kept inside the central registration depository. It's through the FINRA gateway. So there's all kinds of things through the FINRA gateway. You can do financial reporting, you can do um, examination uploads, all kinds of things happen there. But one of the areas that are very prevalent is the central registration depository. Broker dealers and registered reps will have to enter through the web CRD. Now there's a web IARD, and that is for investment advisors and investment advisor representatives. So same kind of thing, but it's a different portal for lack of a better word. Now firms have to register, right? So the broker dealer has form BD, right? I love it, broker dealer, form BD. So the form BD talks a lot about the officers and directors, et cetera, that are required with the broker dealer. Then we have also form BR, and this has to do with branch office. Your branch might be what's called an office of supervisory jurisdiction. So that might be like one of the main offices where you have a lot of compliance stuff, final approval of accounts, final approval of advertising, or you might just have a local branch where people are just selling securities to the public. So there's different levels of branches and that will be identified on Form BR. So then we have investment advisor registration. And they have Form ADV for advisor, right? It's filed for investment advisors to the web IRD. This registers with the Security and Exchange Commission or they register with one or more states. So real quickly, an investment advisor, which is the firm, it's the entity, if they have over $100 million assets under management, they're qualified to register with the Security Exchange Commission and they are a federally covered investment advisor. Or if they're an advisor to a mutual fund, regardless of the assets under management, they're considered federally covered. If they have less assets under management, they would actually register with one or more states. So you're either a state registered advisor or a federally registered advisor. All right, individual registration. Individual registration, professional sets qualifications, employment history. We have to do current registrations, disciplinary act, pending action. This is all found on what's called broker check. Broker check is available to the public, and you can look up your register rep, you can look up yourself, you can look up Bernie Madoff, whoever you want. You can look them up on broker check, and it gives them a history, it gives the history of the individual. So it's available to the public. Now, individual registration, there is a pre-hire requirement. So there is a background check, so you have to find authorized by the candidate. So it's official background check. There's going to be fingerprint cards. And it's the CFTC, which is the commodity group we talked about earlier, they have a form 8T. In any case, there's always some kind of pre-hire background check. So there's certain things that will require a statutory disqualification. Basically, there's certain things that if the register rep or the prospective register rep has done, they'll be statutorily disqualified and not allowed to be uh, registered in the security industry. If you've been convicted of a felony in the last 10 years for a securities related misdemeanor, generally that's a statutory disqualification. If there's been a false statement on the application, so if you lied on the application, you'll be statutory disqualified. Or if you've been expelled by another SRO. So if somebody else kicked you out, 
um, then they, they you can't go you can't get in trouble on the insurance side and run over to the security side. You can't get in trouble on the commodity side and run over to the security side. So if one kicks you out, they all kind of know. All right, different types of registration. Individual registration form AG, that's agent uh, for security. So the AG is state registrations, and AR is uh, the CRD. Um, is an investment advisor rep. So there's different registration. So an AG would be a state level rep and on the broker dealer side and an RA is an investment advisor rep on the investment advisor side. There's a disclosure reporting page. If there's a violation that would require reporting, a statutory disqualification, an internal procedure violation, internal fines of, of either 2,500 excuse me, more than 2,500 or more, or if you suspended somebody from doing business or something like that, you would have to report that, and there's a separate page, which is the disclosure reporting page. All right, individual, you for the company. I love the word. You for the company. That's when the register rep gets registered with a new broker-dealer. It's a uniform application securities industry registration or transfer form. The register rep of a broker-dealer or investment advisor um, must uh, use this form to become registered in the jurisdiction or with an SRO. Registration of individuals are under uh, continuing obligation to amend the form. So if you register, you have to amend it. Like if you change addresses, the register rep has to amend it. If there's been some kind of financial encumbrance that happened, like a lien on you, you have to report that. There's lots of things you have to report. And it usually has to be amended within 30 days. This is an electronic filing. All right, just to bore you to death, I put a lot of little things for the you for you for the firm. So it gives you a quick idea of what they have: general information, fingerprint. You have to be fingerprinted. Registration of non-affiliated firms. Um, you have SRO registration, jurisdiction, which is what state you register. Exam request to open your exam window professional designation, CFP, CFA, other names you might go by, residential history, five years, employment history, 10 years, outside business activities you have to disclose though. Disclose your questions. They have these questions. They said, have you ever been bad? You gotta tell them if you've ever been bad. Sometimes it can create a statutory disqualification. Sometimes it might just be a disclosable event. Sometimes it might not be reportable, but always say, because you don't should be the one that decides, Talk to your compliance professional, they'll help you. All right, and signatures have to be on there. Okay. Next we have, oh, there it is, I already talked about a lot of those, sorry about that. Five years residential, 10 years employment, uh, three, excuse me, three years employment has to be verified, updates within 30 days. No gap, I remember when I first got registered, I was in college before that and there was like, you know, three months that I spent in Beulah, Wyoming camping. And I called up and I said, what do I do? I was in Beulah, Wyoming camping. I didn't really have a residence. They said, well, just use your parents' residence, idiot. I mean, they didn't call me an idiot, but the concept was there. You can't have any gaps. Any outside activities you have to give, any written notification to the broker-dealer may be prohibited um, as the outside activity creates a conflict of interest. All right. Non-registered fingerprint associated persons may um, that come in contact in funds or security um, or um, the firm's books and records or mail. So the uh, fingerprint cards, uh, basic employment information, background checks, um, termination. Uh, the firm submits an NRF non-registered fingerprint. You have to um, terminate that. NRS. All right, Qualified, qualification exam. So if the firm opens up a window, the individual has 120 days to successfully pass their exam. If they are not successful, they have to wait 30 days. After the third attempt, you have to wait six months in order to take the qualified exam. Your registration is, if you've been on the business for more than two years, you have to re-qualify except for if you have the SIE. The SIE doesn't give you a registration, but it's good for four years. Speaking of the SIE, let's talk about the different registrations there are. So the SIE, 
Securities Essential Exam, this is a basic exam. This can be taken without a sponsor. Um, it's $60 to take it. It gives you your foundation for all the other exams. It came out October 1st last year. It's been very widely accepted. People like it. It's a nice base exam. Then if somebody wants to be registered just to sell mutual fund and variable products, it would be a Series 6, and they would do a top-off to their SIE. Series 7 is a general securities principle. That would enable them, the, the individual, to do all the things. They would be able to do options and municipals and all the wonderful stuff. Series 22 is for partnerships. I remember that 2-2, two, two, like partners. Anyways, that's my story there. Uh, the next one is um, Series uh, 57. That's actually the trading exam. Series 79, that's for investment banking. Series 82 is for private placements. Series 86 is for a, um, an analyst, investment analyst. 87 is kind of the supervisor of that analyst. Series 99 is for a operations professional. And then you have your PALS. Your PALS are on the other side. Series 4 is for options, because there's four basic option positions. A branch office or office manager, which we call a BOM, a branch office manager. I, I don't know if anybody calls them BOM. I call them a BOM. Anyways, there's Series 910. Series 24 is a general security principle. Series 26 is the principle for mutual funds and variable products. Series 27 and 28 is for your principal financial officer or your FinOp. And your principal operation officer, and yes, that's a POO, principal operational officer, is for the, the, the big dog operations principal. So series 27 is the big dog one, and series 28 is a limited one for limited firms. There's some other exams out there we wanted to talk about, some additional registration requirements. The MSRB has their own. Series 52 actually is a top-off to the SIE. Series 51 is a municipal principle for package products. If your kids are in a 529, that's actually a state-run fund. So the principles of the 529s or other state and local government securities, which would be package pools, would be Series 51. 53 is the big dog municipal principle. Series 50 is for the municipal advisor. And Series 54 is in a pilot right now, and that is the supervisor to the municipal advisor. Their pilot ends July of this year. I think then they'll go live probably somewhere in the fall or you, later in the year. Yep. Deirdre, we have a question. Um, yeah. When you know, what basically does top off mean? Top off means that it's in addition to the SIE. So your SIE is your base exam. The top off is what allows the registration. So the SIE in and of itself is not a registration, but you can take it without a company sponsor, and that test is good for four years. So if I take an SIE, I have four years pass. I have four years to get registered with a firm. In order to actually act as a registered representative, you must qualify by doing one of the top off exams. And the reason why they have the top off because the SIE and the Series 52 top off makes a, in, in this example, is a municipal, um, a municipal registered municipal uh, rep. Or if you take the SIE and the Series 7 top off together, you have those two you're a Series 7 registered rep. So it's the SIE plus the top off that makes the registration requirement. Does that make sense? Do we have, did I, well, I'm gonna keep going and if you need to stop me, if I need to re-explain that, I'm happy to. All right, so we have some other exams. New York Stock Exchange, you have the Series 14, which is for a compliance officer, chief compliance officer usually. And then there's the Series 16, which is for a, um, a supervisory analyst, a, 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 um, a financial analyst has a supervisor, which is Series 16. NFA has Series 3, that's for the commodities. And if you're just doing commodity pools, that's the 31. The state exams are Series 63, which is for state security sales, or right, for the broker-dealer. And the investment advisor exams are our series 65 for to charge a fee for our investment advice or 66 which is actually a combination of the 65 and the 63 so it gives you both 
All right. Registration termination. U5, <laughs> U4 is a firm. U5, it's like you fired, you're out of here. So it's voluntary or involuntary. So I'm sort of cheesy when I say you fired. But when you leave the firm, there's a U5. The firm has 30 days to file the U5 upon termination. And they have to say in the termination whether it was a voluntary termination or for cause. So if it was for cause, that has to be disclosed. For cause has to be disclosed. Generally speaking, the U5. Now, once again, your registration is good for two years, right? Two years before you have to retest coming back. So you can take two years out for the industry to come back in and not have to retest. The SIE is good for four years, but it's not a registration, right? The SIE is just a base exam. All right. Registration termination. So broker-dealer registration withdrawal form BDW, registration withdrawal, uniform application for the withdrawal of the broker-dealer. Um, so we've uh, done several of these. So when you're doing a broker-dealer withdrawal, it actually takes 60 days and they don't give you a watch. There's no fanfare. So you file your BDW. You cannot do anything in the securities industry. You have to stay financially solvent. And 60 days later, you file your last financial report, and it's over. I was like excited to see a plaque, gold watch, nothing. All right, that's a full BDW. W stands for withdraw. A partial BDW, if you're just removing yourself from a jurisdiction, if you're no longer going to sell securities in, in, um, in Michigan, you would do a partial withdraw and withdraw the firm from just Michigan, which is one of the jurisdictions. So there's a full BDW and a partial BDW. W stands for withdraw. All right, and on the investment advisor side, there's an ADV, right, withdrawal. So there is um, the registered investment advisor, ADVW, they can withdraw. You can once again do a partial withdrawal just from a jurisdiction or a full withdrawal from all jurisdictions. So similar to the broker-dealer one. Oh, and then, of course, everybody's favorite topic, continuing education. So we have a continuing education. So there's two different types of continuing education in the broker-dealer world. One of them is firm element, and it's exactly like it sounds. The firm must write a training plan based on a needs analysis. So the broker-dealer is going to sit back, and they're, they're going to interview management. They're going to interview register reps. They're going to look at any customer complaints. They're going to look at any regulatory issues. Every year, they're going to sit back and they're going to take and analyze all the things that have happened and what their reps do and what products they sell. And based on all that information, the needs analysis, they're going to write a training plan. So every firm is going to have different ones, and people within the firm might have different training plans. You know, your trading desk might have a very different training plan than the retail group might have a very different training plan than the investment banking group. So the firm element is based on the firm's individual needs for their reps and associated persons that qualify or required to take it. Now, regulatory element, love the words. This is actually the regulators require us to do it. It's with a hun in 120 days of your second anniversary. So if you get registered in 2019, 2021, you'd have to take your first regulatory element. All right, so the first one is 20, uh, is 21, 22, 23, 24, you'd have to take it again. 25, 26, 27, you'd have to take it again. So regulatory element. Well, a little bit ago, a few years back, they actually allowed the regulatory element to be delivered on computer, our continuing education. So that's wonderful. Historically, we used to have to go down to a center like a Prometric Center and actually take our exam there. It's about three hours. Now we can actually do it on our website, right at our office. We have to have, the firm has to have some sort of procedures to have some kind of proctoring element to it. And an individual can take it and bookmark it and come finish it at a later day. So there has to be some sort of firm procedure to say how they're going to monitor that. So I think I went. All right. I actually think I did it again. It's online. I think I did it twice. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I must really love continuing education. And at that point, I'm going to say thank you and open it up for more questions. I'm happy to talk about anything. If I don't know, I promise I'll tell you I don't know. Look it up and get back to you.
So do we have any questions coming in for Deirdre? I can't believe you kept it to exactly 45 minutes. I mean, that that's the mark of a true teaching and training professional. So perfect, perfectly done. Applause, Thanks. applause. Everybody's on mute, so um, we're going to need to have the questions come in through the chat. If anybody has anything. I don't know. I always learn something new whenever um, whenever I sit down with you, Deirdre, I always learn something new. <laughs> so we're getting lots of lots of thank yous and lots of kudos. So um, big thanks to Deirdre for joining us today. Also, keep in mind we have two more webinars coming up uh, July and August, both having to do with um, entering the financial services business. Um, so I hope that you all will be able to join us for those and we have the monthly going on through the end of the year but I just think the next two are going to be super interesting because they're about um, who's entering the financial services business and, and what do people in the financial services businesses like actually do so hot topics for our community and hopefully we'll get everybody to um, join those and again thanks to Deirdre great job as always Thank you. I had a lot of fun. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.